Hi. Mm. Nice to meet you, Deepak. Yes, nice to meet you. on this chair because I know people. <laughs> for knowledge of Jesus in November 1st, November 17th. Uh, Jason has a PhD in marketing and consumer behavior from the University of Michigan. Um, he's an associate professor of marketing at the College of Business at Oregon State. Um, he's written about wisdom in consumer affairs and the tension between individual freedoms and collective health and wise consumption. And he's um, going to be here for, for a couple weeks and We'll meet with people if they're interested in meeting with him, and he's um, probably going to give a talk if we twist his arm appropriately. So, so and I want to thank uh, Deepak uh, Ramallah for coming to visit and speak with us today, uh, sharing some of his thoughts about wisdom in his talk, Where Wisdom Meets Play. Uh, I want to also specially acknowledge um, and give our thanks to Modern Recovery Services, an online therapy platform, for their support to make this event possible. Um, and we also appreciate the continued support of the Social Sciences Division at the University of Chicago, uh, which has supported the Center for Practical Wisdom. So, so Deepak is the founder and artistic director of Project Fuel, uh, an organization which documents human wisdom. Project Fuel collects life lessons from people all over the world and turns them into interactive and performance activities to pass on the learning. Uh, and I recommend taking a look at their website. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, Deepak is an educator, a poet, and an artist, um, has served as the kindness ambassador for UNESCO. Um, his methodology is recognized as a world's top 100 innovations in education. He's worked with Wisdom of the Maasai Tribe, young girls in Afghanistan, uh, sex workers in Kamathapura, uh, earthquake survivors in Nepal, Syrian refugees in Europe, and migration affected villages um, in India. He's from a small rural town in a remote part of India and received his master's degree from the School of Education at Harvard. Um, and his wise wall projects uh, have included a 600 year old uh, abandoned village in, um, in, um, in rural Uttarakhand, uh, Kati, um, and route uh, to the Pindari Glacier, and in Tanzania with the Maasai um, and in the village Arusha. As a poet, he's published a book, 50 Toughest Questions uh, in Life. And the 50 Toughest Questions of Life invites people to have a conversation with themselves about themselves. Um, Deepak's quest began after he was inspired by the life lesson of a young girl who said life is not about giving easy answers, but answering tough questions. Uh, Deepak has written lyrics that have appeared in Hindi cinema 
um, not something many of us could say or conceive of, um, and has been featured in the show The Duarists. Uh, as a speaker, he's given talks at the United Nations headquarters, Facebook and Google, as well as a TED Talk. He's currently on a speaking tour that includes our lecture, Wesleyan University, Harvard Graduate School of Education, South Asian Literature and Art Festival in California. In today's talk, Where Wisdom Meets pay, Play, uh, Deepak will talk about his work as it pertains to practical wisdom, to forward the understanding of every life lesson, how he integrates art, wisdom, and education. Uh, please join me in welcoming Deepak Lamola. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, my name is Deepak Ramola. And Ramola actually means someone who is curious about other people's stories. So that worked out well for my career, uh, that correlation. But as we begin this uh, conversation, this dialogue, I would like for you to think about the people you have met in your life. Uh, the grandmothers who have fed you food and stories at the kitchen table. I would like for you to think about, you know, tourists uh, that you have met or you have been in other places and people you have engaged with and the curiosities they have presented from their lives and the ones you have presented laced in inquiry about theirs. I would like for you to think about passengers, co-passengers on the subway ride that you sometimes see and say, how fascinating. I wonder what this person is thinking about or knows. I have been curious about all of those people for the last 15 years of my life. Have been thinking, what do people in regular walks of life learn that I don't or will never be able to because the context and the realities of my situations are vaguely and vastly different from those of others. In the last 15 years, I've had a chance to not only have that inquiry inside me like many of us, but I've actually sometimes embarrassing. In 2016, I was working with Syrian refugees across Europe. I was helping with the Syrian refugee integration and documenting the life lessons and wisdom of refugees, uh, people displaced by the war, economic refugees, and using that to assist not-for-profit organization, government bodies, and schools in understanding the life and lifestyle of people who they were going to inhabit on their land and in their country. During the tour, which was 90 days long, I was invited to teach at a refugee camp in Amsterdam. This refugee camp was interesting and unique because in Amsterdam they didn't have space to uh, put all the people who were migrating. So they took abandoned prison cells and they put all those refugees there. They were eating out of this black box uh, bland food uh, three times a day and had very little communication with people back home or outside. In this camp, I was very nervous of having been invited because I knew that people were already facing many difficulties. But I went in and started sharing the stories I had gathered from my tour so far. And to my surprise, everybody was pretty warm and open and they participated and we sang together and we played games, except this one guy. He sat at the back of the room and look piercingly at me. No matter what I said, how many jokes I cracked, how many games I wanted to play, he said, I'm not interested. After a little bit of poking, I asked him, what's your problem? Why are you not participating? And why are you in this room if you don't want to? And he said, well, you don't know my story. And that's why I'm upset. He said, well, I came all the way from India to hear stories, so let's hear it. And he starts telling me about how he was a teacher back in Syria. All his life savings he had to put in the hands of a smuggler who was going to ensure that he reached the port or on Italian shores and guarantee a new life. He had to choose between his wife and his mother. And all those difficult decisions trying to gather money to make sure all three of them can travel far beyond the Mediterranean Sea allowed him this sense of fear, the sense of dislike towards the world. However, he started giving these details about where the boat stopped and who the smuggler was and how much they gave. And as those details rolled, 
another refugee in the room stood up and said, no way, you were in that boat too? I was on that boat. To which this angry refugee says, I can't believe you were in that boat. I just cannot accept it. So now there are two angry people in the room, me and this other guy. And he says, why can't you believe I was on your boat? I'm telling you this is the name of the, ref uh, the smuggler. This is how much we paid. He says, I can't believe you were on the same boat because you're the happiest guy in this refugee camp. You never complain about the food. You act as a translator for young children. And you participate in stupid workshops like this guy pointing towards me. Ouch. <laughs> However, when I turned to this guy and said, but why can't you accept it? He said, because I cannot believe I got off the same boat and became this bitter. And he got off the same boat and chose something else. And these six months that I've spent being bitter, this guy is the walking reminder of what I could have done with my time instead. Those stories, those anecdotes, were defining not only on the tour, but also made me think all the stuff I was hearing and the stories I was gathering was mostly from adults. What did children think about refugees in these countries? The ones who had to sit with somebody who did not look like them and study for the rest of their school year. So I convinced the school in Stockholm to let me come in and talk refugee life lessons. The school said, no, 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 that's not what we talk about here. I somehow convinced them to let me teach for 20 minutes. And if the students were discomforted, I would leave. I ended up teaching for three and a half hours. And at the end of the class, I asked the children whose story they most resonated with, very much like this guy, many others. And they said they wanted to write letters. So they wrote letters to refugees whose story they most resonated with. One of them reads, dear refugee, I want to welcome you. We love and accept you for who you are. Here, there is hope and many possibilities. Sincerely, Spencer Peterson, age 12. This is one of the 60 letters that the class produced that day. There was another letter by uh, an 11-year-old girl who said, dear refugee, hold on for 10 years, because in 10 years, I will be the policymakers. <laughs> and the ball is in your court. Can you hold on for 10 years? These letters followed by their own life lessons, no matter where, even in the darkest cave, there is hope, are lessons that they actually wanted to pass on to the refugees in their country. These stories presented not only a new level of assimilation, a new level of thinking that I was uh, learning on the tour, but it also validated something that I had known even prior to going on this refugee tour that everybody knows something that we may or may not know. And if we were to ask them that question, we might be able to discover it. This inquiry of asking other people what their life lesson is has led me to some fascinating rooms and spaces and learn from kids as young as 10-year-olds. When I was three uh, to four-year-old, my mom and my dad broke up. My dad was a horrible person. I don't want to talk about that. I was all the time crying, but now I'm better, my mom too. I never give up. I learned to never give up. So 10-year-old Emma's letter posted all the way to India because she wanted to share what she had figured at the end of that very difficult phase in her life. Emma's story reminds me of many other, including my own mother, who never had a chance to go to school uh, or study. In fact, when I got through Howard, my sister was crying. My mom ran in and said, what happened? And my sister said, Deepa got Harvard. And she said, is it curable? <laughs> so <laughs> that's really how distant this world, even speaking to you this morning, I was trying to tell her what the University of Chicago is and <laughs> what wisdom research looks like. Very, very distant from the realities of the vision boards our resources allow us to pin our hopes on. My mother, who was pulled out of school in grade five by her grandmother, uh, who didn't want, to didn't want any girl in the house to study. And so my mother, being the eldest of eight siblings, was pulled out of school and never allowed a chance to flip another notebook, have uh, an educator uh, write something. My mother growing up, however, presented an anomaly. I never believed that story because she's one of the smartest people I know. Uh, 
She still does the finances of the house. For a woman who's never studied profit and loss, she gives the best relationship advice after every heartbreak <laughs> for a woman who's read no philosophy books. She manages all the conflicts between relatives and families and is, the, is a great communication expert. At age 14, somewhere a week before or after this picture was taken, angry, I went to my mother and I said, you're the biggest liar in the world. And she laughed and she said, what makes you say that? And I said, because everything you do is what they teach us in school. Math, communication, debate. How do you know so much if you didn't go to school? So she laughed some more and she said, well, the fact is I didn't go to school, but the truth is the world is my classroom. I'm learning from everyone. To my 14-year-old brain, that meant if she's learning from living, that means everyone who's living is learning something. And where is that knowledge? Where is that information? And curious, I went to the master of all masters. I mean, previously masters of all masters, now it's chat GPT, Google. <laughs> and I typed my grandmother's name because she used to live in the upper Him Himalayas. And wrote my grandmother's name, wrote grandma's life lesson. Nothing showed up. So I looked up the most famous person I knew in our town. Nothing showed up. And I continued that exercise for an hour and felt, wow, you have to be a certain level of rich or famous or, uh, you know, have some sort of notoriety for your knowing, for your wisdom to travel far beyond your family. I wanted my mother's learning to travel to girls in Afghanistan, and I wanted to learn from somebody in Eritrea. But that wasn't available. So at age 14, uh, to my parents' terror, <laughs> I started collecting life lessons of everybody I met. The reason I say to my parents' terror, because everybody who was invited home for dinner wasn't made to eat until they had answered a simple question, what has life taught you? And slowly, as I started gathering these life lessons on the footnotes of my notebook, on the margins of my journal, I started to learn and see the world from the perspective of thousands of people from my small little town on the foothills of the Himalayas. I realized that everybody was carrying some insight. By the time I was 17 years old, had been heavily bullied in school to the point where I didn't want to go to school, I realized I wasn't bitter. And I was trying to trace back why I wasn't bitter. And that was because all of these people who had generously shared their life lessons and stories with me had allowed me a way to see the larger picture, to not focus on the tree, but have a forest view. And I wanted to share those learnings that actually saved my life with other people. The best way to do that was to create some kind of a metaphor with these life lessons that I had gathered so that they didn't seem preachy, but rather they seem applied and playful and engaging. So I started designing life lessons of everyday people into these fun games and activities, allowing students in my classrooms to first play the game, derive their own life lessons, and learn and share what somebody else had learned when that life lesson uh, inspired that activity. So it was a big loop of someone's life lesson, playing an activity, learning something from the activity and discovering who inspired it. These smaller, playful, immersive experiences allowed for participants in the class to negotiate with someone's story and discover their own. Many years ago, a woman on a metro said to me, if your face can surprise you in the mirror every morning, you're still having a good life. And she said that was what her gratitude practice was. So many, many years later, I'm going to come back to this. I turned her life lesson into an activity. I designed small mirrors, gave it to students in a class in Punjab, and asked them to write down 40 things that they discovered in their face in four minutes. All of them looked carefully. Some of them counted their eyelashes. Others counted their freckles and pimples and reflected to what they really liked about themselves. At the end of the class, I got this letter from one of the girls who said, I was thinking, smile does not suit me, but after the session, I found 
it looks awesome on my face. When I investigated further, I was told that this girl had been repeatedly told growing up that smile does not suit her face and she ruins pictures. And so she had voluntarily stopped smiling. Seeing her smile in small measures in that mirror allowed her actually to have the courage to fully smile. A um, few years ago, I reconnected with her and she's luckily smiling a lot in her Facebook pictures. <laughs> in many ways, this, this learning of 8 billion people across the world allows me to know that there are 8 billion people on this planet. And if we were to do a conservative estimate of one life lesson per person, we would have 8 billion perspectives about our lives, about things that surround us, and things that we would never discover. And that has motivated me ever since. How do we collect the knowledge, the experiences, the sparks of wisdom from these everyday people and make it accessible to the other? this cross-pollination of knowledge between different people. Designing the activities has been an interesting thing because in, uh, you know, in Sanskrit, there is a word uh, for the word universe. In the, in the West, we say universe, but in Sanskrit, we say Brahmand. And the word Brahmand, in its etymology, actually, is said to have been borrowed from Lord Brahma, who created the universe in the Hindu mythology. But interestingly, the universe is not a good translation of the word Brahman, because Lord Brahma had to first create the space in which the universe could exist and evolve. In a similar sense, I borrow that Sanskrit phrase to describe this activity design. It's not really about just the life lesson. The activity is the space in which the life lesson exists, and people investigate, interrogate, discover, and unpack their own learnings allowing much more room for it to evolve. These life lessons have been anchored, or this entire philosophy has been anchored in these five core values, very much in alignment to some of the amazing research that wisdom scholars like Howard have been doing. Uh, finding perspective, taking and sharing, establishing relationship between seemingly dissimilar things, uh, questioning along with answering. I found in the last 15 years, some of the wisest people ask the best questions. Without really giving a response, they could allow you to get to your own answer by asking great questions, reflection, and narrative play. These stories have found many different ways to reach people across the world, and we had to be constantly innovative to make this wisdom accessible. One of the examples uh, that I want to share, there's a bunch of examples I want to share through the talk, but one of the key examples in education I want to share is about the Wisdom Corridor project. We started going to schools uh, in these last year, last many years and discovered that school walls were laced with the quotes and proverbs of famous people, Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Mandela. But if the kid had a follow-up question, they really couldn't ask anybody of the people hung up on the walls. And then there was this distancing happening between who their role model was. That role model was always somebody far off in the social media sector or somebody who they had read about, but not really people around them. Through the Wisdom Corridor project, we uh, developed documentation and interviewing skills in young children to be mini ethnographers and investigate and document the wisdom of their own educators and non-academic staff. So what these kids basically did, or do still with projects, is they interview every single person on campus of what life has taught them, and then create a physical corridor with those stories. And every time a child has a difficult day before they decide to go to the school counselor, sometimes, at least in the global south and in places like India, even visiting the school counselor's office is a big taboo. If you're seen there, there's something wrong with you. And so, Creating a wisdom corridor allowed children to find somebody, a safe adult, who they could actually go and confide to, whose story came closest to what they were going through. These wisdom corridors became not only a point for children to understand their teachers, their non-academic staff better, but also learn from every person who was moving. And if they didn't agree, then they could go back and have a follow-up question. I've had incidents from teachers saying, 
you know, I was not being very patient in the class today. And one of the kids came to me and said, on the wall, you said, be patient. That's what your life has taught, taught you. You know better, do better. <laughs> so whereas it has become for children to learn from their immediate adults better, it has also allowed adults to be more accountable in that setting. Um, reports of uh, good mental health relationship between the adults, caring adults and children, uh, sharing of stories, creative expressions. Some of these life stories from the walls have been adopted into school level plays and books by children in reverence to their teachers learning. These stories also uh, allow us to see and discover what children think about. These are questions that kids were asking when they were asked to think about what they would ask the most wisest person uh, they would meet. What happens to you after you die? <laughs> Why doesn't everyone not want to be kind? Why can't I have a pet Komodo dragon? Fair enough. <laughs> Can people uh, who are mean be nice? Uh, why has God not made more animals? This is an interesting dialogue. He said, well, all the animals that exist have existed forever. Has God stopped imagining Deepak? When you discover a space in which your questions are respected, you realize that even children can be wise and have wisdom. The phrase wise child when I started teaching at 17 was an oxymoron. Wisdom was something you found on the other side of the grad school mountain with gray hair and a lot of student debt paid off. But I have discovered over these years that some of the most fascinating life lessons actually come from children. A young boy from Bulgaria who sends in his life lesson a few months ago saying, never eat an ice cream from both ends. You will make a lot of mess and you will not enjoy it. And that life lesson has come to serve so many adults across the world who are trying to eat their favorite ice creams of relationships and jobs and careers from both ends. Or a five-year-old girl who said, you know what? When you're done using the jar, remember to close the lid. Or don't put water near things you like, like your laptop or your important files. Don't kiss with braces on. That's an important one. Saved my life, at least in school. These learnings from everyday people, even little humans, has been revelatory to understand what is that, that they know in their immediate reality and how can we expand that for the understanding of a larger whole. But education was not only the way to investigate human wisdom and the wisdom of everyday people from common corridors of life. When we started working with rural and indigenous communities, literacy rates were low. Many of the people had never gone to school like my mother. And they were not interested in being preached to with a notebook and a pen. So we started looking at wisdom as a currency through art. In 2016, we partnered with one such village, a ghost village. Uh, the state I come from faces severe migration out of nearly you know, 1,600 villages in the state have been declared as ghost villages. And out of 200 families in this village, only 12 were left behind. We traced all those 200 families wherever they were in the world, interviewed, conducted deep ethnographies of their learnings, of their memories of the village, of cultural wisdom that they had taken and carried to their city life, and returned to the village, partnered with the 12 families, and hand-painted every single wall of that village. If you go there, it's like an open air art gallery. You can walk from any lane to any lane. There are life lessons. There are stories that have inspired life lessons. And something interesting started to happen. This wisdom translated into art allowed for the local government and the media to pay attention and brought back local tourism. People started to come to see a painted village they started to come to talk to the 12 families to understand these stories because we hadn't put their description. That allowed for many different social impact changes in the village. It led to a digital uh, and English speaking classes being started right at the doorstep of the village. People started coming to train, revive a 500 year old festival that had ceased to exist for the last 60 years. The social impact of people seeing their knowledge, their wisdom, their learnings translated and celebrated on a global and uh, you know, even on a national and regional scale allowed them to say, 
we can take some steps to change uh, the condition of our migration and the state. The first time I was telling people I want to paint a whole village with life lessons, you can imagine it wasn't the well, most well-received idea. Uh, the person I had gone to for funding said, you're going to do what? Paint a village? Hand paint a village? How many houses? 72. Um, but I believe when somebody says you can't do something, do it twice. And next time, take a lot of pictures, because the first time you'll be busy doing the stuff. So another year, we partnered with another village on the foothills of the Pindhari Glacier, uh, a village so remote that it feels like living in the 17th century. No roads, no electricity, no internet. When I came out with my team from this village, we had forgotten what a car honk sounds and how light feels on uh, your eyes. But the people here, too, reveal something fascinating, that there were stories, that there was funds of knowledge they already possessed, and their cultural capital laced in folk songs. Their wisdom was embedded in folk games they played every evening. It was in the folk theater. It was in the elders who you approached with when you faced with a complex dilemma. These stories allowed us to not only paint with the villagers, which becomes an accessible way to have a conversation. Because many a times when you go to a village and you ask a woman who's never gone to school, what is your life lesson? She most certainly will say, I don't have answer to that question. I didn't go to school. And then you say, do you have kids? Yes, I have two kids. How old? 12 and 14. Do you have any advice for them? And there goes four hours, <laughs> them telling how they want their kids and all the kids in the world to do better. These conversations require you to choreograph differently in different circumstances. It asks you to bring in children, to bring in all stakeholders to play. And wisdom as a currency has also allowed us to see with tribes as old and rare as the Maasai in Tanzania. When I went to Tanzania in 2018 to document the wisdom of women all the way from Miss Tanzania to a Maasai woman, I found out that the Maasai women were walking nine hours every day for water. And we invited uh, one of the women's son, Mama Mary, that you see in the picture, to India for a fellowship program. And he saw the painted villages and he said, can we bring this to my community and can we use the painting to raise funds for something else. Platforms like Google Arts and Culture came on board to create the first most in-depth collection of the Maasai wisdom and life. And so now there are more than 3,000 Maasai pictures taken by the community, voiced by the community, more than 40 films on Google uh, that you can see in a first-person voice from the Maasai. The reason that's important is because they didn't want free money. They didn't want someone to come and do philanthropy in their village and build something. They wanted to honor that money with another currency, and wisdom seemed like a good fit. Took four and a half years of a lot of laughing, being dressed as a Maasai, and being proposed to marry one of the Maasai people. But these stories eventually allowed us to translate the Maasai uh, in, wisdom into artworks, their stories into artworks, train local painters, photographers, build a community center, a physical community center that now serves as both a medical unit and a school. And more importantly, it actually allowed us to build three water harvesting units that has reduced every Maasai woman's walk by eight hours every day. When I think about what a life lesson can do, I think it's a starting point, and it can go in many directions, connect, make a difference, make a change, but more importantly, allow for the people who possess it to see their own story and their own lives. This is one of the most important projects that I would like to head towards the wrap with. Knowing that everybody has wisdom and some spark of wisdom, uh, I believe it's very difficult to be wise all the time, and maybe Howard, you can tell me. It's like as being uh, as difficult as being good all the time. You know, you aspire to be good. You you are in the pursuit of goodness. But to discover it meant to go on a bigger exploration. 
In 2020, we received a grant from the Singapore International Foundation to create a world wisdom map and document life lessons in the thick of COVID as an act of building hope and optimism uh, with all the grief that surrounded people. This map features life lessons from all the 195 countries. It has Nobel laureates wisdom and grandmothers in Nepal and LGBTQ activists in El Salvador. And the wisdom documented is designed into an, a curriculum, um, an educational curriculum that is free to download. And within the first six months, reached more than 450,000 people across 45 countries. It has been designed into artworks by school children, kids who pick up stories of people from other parts of the world and visualize it. It has been investigated by data scientists who see what are the patterns that we see in these stories. And so as much as I would like to believe that uh, most people's mother saying, be kind, sticks, it's mostly Beyonce. <laughs> that is going to likely stick with people. Because your mother's voice has become void noise at this point. How do we allow ourselves to create role models closer to home and in all circles of influence? How do we allow for this data to inform how we teach in our classrooms? Asking a very important question. How do we raise not just smart kids, but wise children? How do we nurture that? And what would it take for a child to absorb a new worldview, quite different from their own, to take the longest walk one can take from your perspective to someone else's perspective and find a middle ground. By the way, his life lesson, his name is Abdul Rahman, uh, an adorable boy in Antwerp, Belgium. And his life lesson is, before you learn how to ride a bike, learn where the brakes are. <laughs> or it can hurt you real bad. <laughs> Uh, we've translated the wisdom we've documented into books. Uh, 50 Toughest Questions of Life is one version of it. Uh, the questions people have asked, the questions that have birthed themselves in the process. Maybe I'll let you ponder on that uh, at the end of the talk. Are you the art, the artist, or the visitor? We have taken it to places where people might not have immediate access. And let me end with this story. There's a place in Banaras, India. Banaras is a city on, uh, next to the holy river Ganga, or Ganges, as it's called. And it's believed in the Hindu mythology that if you take your last breath next to Kashi or Ganga, you attain moksha or salvation. Because of that one belief system, over the last several hundred years, salvation homes were built for people to breathe their last in peace in a city they wanted to be. Over the years, out of the many hundred salvation homes, only three are left behind. And out of the three, only two are functional. And one of them, Mukti Bhavan, is a place which only gives you two weeks to stay, which means if you don't die within two weeks, you have to check out. You can laugh. <laughs> the first time I heard that, I thought, not only do you have to accept your time has come, but you have to do that with the timer on. And I need to find out what do these people know before that time runs out. So I went to Mukti Bhavan and spent time there living with people who were convinced that their time had come. To their credit, three of them did make the mark. But the most interesting person, <laughs> most interesting person was the person who was running this salvation home, Mr. Bhairav Nath Shukla. Mr. Shukla had been on the job for 44 years. So when I asked him one morning, how many people have passed away in your arms? He said 12,136. 12, 12,136. And I said, that's good data. What does it teach us about life? Over the next few days, he gave me one lesson for every thousand people who had taken their last breath in his arms. And those 12 life lessons from a man who had seen 12,000 deaths since the article or the work came out, at Project Fuel, we have received every week without fail a, a, an Instagram DM or an email from somebody who was able to let go of a deep hurt, who was able to move on, who was able to discover, follow their passion because of Mr. Shukla's 
insight and wisdom in that space. I have also received 82 emails from people who did not commit suicide because of the learning of the 12 life lessons. I think of Mr. Shukla, he unfortunately passed away during COVID. And I think about how important it is for a man who sits next to this holy river in a small place, crammed up, doing his daily job, but how important that learning, that knowing is for the rest of the world. And if there was a way for us to collect 12 more life lessons from people who had seen other things, not just death, maybe we would have a chance to save 82 more lives in the world and 82 more. And that computation will allow us to create a safe environment where everybody can teach us something that might be of value. My hope really is to create a world wisdom bank where life lessons are an oasis of repository. Educators can borrow them in their classroom to have a dialogue. Artists can borrow them to lead campaigns in refugee camps with war on the rise everywhere. How do we help them to integrate not just refugees, but sex workers and break stereotypes? At the start of Project Fuel, when I was young, I would like to believe I'm still young, but we would take life lessons of sex workers from uh, red light districts of Kamatipura and Sonagachi on customer negotiation and teach that to business school students. Until the last 10 minutes of the class, we would not reveal that these are life lessons from sex workers. And if you would ask them, which theory did you like the most? They would name somebody from an Ivy League that they assume the lesson was coming. Breaking that stereotype of who you can learn from allows us to not be just beneficiaries, but collaborators of a larger system, where our voices matter not because we know less, but because we know enough about who we are. I would like uh, to thank you for listening, but more importantly, I would encourage you to think, what is it that life has taught you? And maybe go home and pick the person you think you know the most, your parents, your partner, your children, sit across them and guess their life lesson. And then ask them, are you right? And there are chances you would be surprised with what has dictated and guided their life's philosophy. Simple question, what's your life lesson? Is an invitation to a world where classrooms, like my mother said, expand beyond a university and engulf the whole world. Thank you. Q&A. Do you have a question now? I just have a question or two and ask it in the tone or the um, people that have an audience in the Q&A. Um, and it's on. So I have a lot of questions, but we <laughs> still have a little bit of time to talk. But I'm curious when you have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of life lessons assembled, how does one help someone find a life lesson? I mean, they're not going to be all equally informative and helpful to every individual. And so, how does one separate the wheat from the chaff? I mean, I don't actually think that there's chaff, but for an individual, how, how would you help them guide themselves to find a lesson that's useful? Hmm. That's an important question, actually, because this work is not prescriptive. It's suggestive. And what's, what it is encouraging people to really think about is that if in a class, out of the 40 lessons shared, none of them fit the problem that you're trying to solve or the understanding you're trying to achieve, then go out there and meet other people. So it's encouraging a way of thinking. But what has really helped in the last few years is very intentful collaboration with institutions. I'll give you a small example. Many years ago, an Indian organization called Menstrupedia that teaches young girls uh, menstrual awareness came up and said, we want you to design a curriculum. And when we started interviewing women and young girls who were menstruating, 
they said the biggest problem in menstruation were the men. So go ask them. So we started collecting life lessons of the role men had played in breaking menstrual taboos. And using the life lessons of the men, we designed an entire participative curriculum. When we went to the classroom, very under-resourced classrooms where, uh, you know, these conversations were very, you know, outside the boundaries, the girl having uh, told that these life lessons were designed on the life lessons of men actually came up and said, they know? which was the first stage of having a conversation. So, I, I mean, to answer your question, I think very mindful collaborations, customizing these learnings to the environment uh, allows you to find the wheat from the chaff. But overall, it's about that shift in perspective that, ah, I can find my learnings from people around, and they might have just told me 20 people, but hey, there are a million more that I can go to, and let me start with that. So it's creating that mindset of being your own researcher, allowing that awareness to happen. And this serves that as a good precursor to believing it. So that becomes one way. That's a beautiful question. A, I think most people who, who have a difficult time sharing wisdom is the ones who believe wisdom is something on a pedestal. It's so inaccessible and far out from them that they have nothing to do with it. Because the moment they associate it with themselves, they will become accountable and more responsible. And so the moment somebody says, you are wise, as if you can't go and make a mistake or you can't be silly again. So this sense of fear and taboo uh, allows for a lot of people to distance themselves from calling themselves wise or calling someone else wise. The other thing is that wisdom actually has been put on a pedestal for many, many generations. And learning from everybody makes it pedestrian. And that takes time. It takes conversations. It takes a change in culture, in behavior, in thinking. Uh, so that's another. And the third is making it playful. You know, the moment the conversation about wisdom starts, everybody becomes very quiet and very serious. Whereas if you talk about other things, there are engaging ways for people to enter that room and have that conversation. So how do we break down these large, big barricades about the simple concept that we have felt, known, and understood throughout uh, you know, human history in some form and shape, but we see it only outside of ourselves. We have to find a way to bring it to our own context and our lives. Um, and not be afraid to call to be called wise or to aspire to be wise uh, from one week to another, I think, uh, that. I must confess, though, whoever asked this question, when I started collecting life lessons, I thought by the time I am 18, I will be the first person in human history to commit no mistakes, because I would know so much. By the time I was 18, I realized the beauty of learning from other people was no, that not you did not commit any mistakes, but that you did not make the same mistake that a billion people found what happens at the end. You could change the plot, you could play it. What happens when you paint a village? Nobody knows the answer. People know what happens when you paint in a community. So allowing that shift to happen uh, will allow people to participate more in the wisdom dialogue, I think, Th rather than just seeing it as um, an academic or a very high uh, saint pursuit, sage pursuit. <laughs> to me that play is kind of fundamental to the learning process for everyone. Mm -hmm. I think we're kind of aware of it with little children, but as we get older and older and older, it becomes less, we're, we're less aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, seems to me that good scholarship is play. There's a certain amount of like, you know, exploration and, and joy that has to be part of it. So I'm curious, um, and I think that, you know, we, we touched on with the last question, like uh, about kind of creating a context in which that play can occur. And what would you say, uh, if you, I know this is kind of a big question, but what would you say like as far as like how you can create a context for play, like it's we can, we can envision a context for play if we have a room full of five-year-olds, right? What does that look like, 
if you're entering into a space of, you know, um, l let's say like for, for Syrian refugees, right? Like, can you mention that the one guy was sort of resistant a little bit, right? Like, so what are some of the lessons you've learned about how you can create a context for play? You know, like in addition to kind of like, you can give people activities to do, but how do you create that kind of freedom that really is essential to, to the learning hmm. process? One of the things that comes to my mind, it's almost like giving my trade secret away, but when I work with, with communities that I don't speak the language of or are charged with trauma, you never go in having a conversation about life's wisdom. You go in having a conversation about how vulnerable you are and how vulnerable they are and acknowledging that authenticity. Uh, many years ago, when I was working with uh, survivors of the Nepal earthquake, uh, I would go into these classrooms and the only thing I had time to figure out in that situation was learn a folk song. So I would go and sing a Nepali folk song, which went like, Vari Jamuna, Jamuna ko bhedai mamano kamana. And the kids would be like, you're not singing it right, that's not the melody. And it would open a door for them to say, come, let's help you. And then you could go on. So whatever that tool is before as a precursor to having that wisdom conversation, Many years later, when I was working with the Syrian refugees, I remember just to cheer a woman who, whose daughter had been abducted by the Taliban. Uh, when the interview finished, I said, you know, I know a song in your language. And she said, which one? It's the only song I had learned. It says, Dane pe dana, dana na, dil dosti lagane, na na na. And I sang. She became furious, unlike all the other people who had appreciated it on the tour. And she said, that's not, not the song, that's the wrong lyrics. What are you doing? And I said, what did I do? This is a song. How do you know, sitting in a refugee camp, which, which is the right lyrics and song? She said, my dad is the composer of that song. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew up doing pirouettes on that song all my life, so I know it. So it allows for that discovery. I think what we need to know is that the conversation with wisdom has to be decorated with tools and uh, mechanisms and coping mechanisms that people have used for generations in, in villages, in indigenous communities, in city lives. And the second important thing is metaphor making. How do we facilitate an ecosystem in which wisdom thrives? At least from what I know, uh, the little I know of the context is the activity design is the process of metaphor making. And the more metaphors you give people, the less you, uh, the less you threaten them. You disarm them from saying, oh, this is not about me. This is about this situation. A very uh, last example I can give you is, if you're talking about inclusion, and when we have conversations with inclusion, especially in communities that are riddled with hate or polarization, we give them a small visual. A ship, an airplane, a skateboard, a car, and a fish. And we ask them, which is the odd one between a ship, uh, uh, an airplane, a car, a skateboard, and a fish? Most people will say fish. And you say, OK, good job finding the odd one. Now try to make the odd one feel in. Convince the fish that it belongs to the group. Immediately, you will see how people struggle with their empathy, with this fish, but this context. But it's not really about them. It's not saying you are not empathetic. But it's them having a space to say, wow, I'm really having difficulty coming up with something for this fish. Am I empathetic to other people in my life? And that becomes a reflective part of the exercise. So metaphor making, I think, is a crucial aspect of giving people space to not feel like you are attacking them uh, and judging their wisdom, but rather making it playful to, to enter a conversation. So those two things. Thanks. We probably have space for one more question, if anyone has a question. Um, do we have a question? Um, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate your um, work, actually, your presentation, but also the work that led you to give this presentation. Uh, you touched on it, but then I'd like you, if you can, say more about your, um, the work in India, I can understand, you know, you go and you speak, well, although there are thousands of languages in India, <laughs> but yes. you find a common place of talking. But you also have worked with Maasai and Syrians and so forth. How do you deal with issue of uh, language and translation? Because life wisdom is you know, embedded in linguistic uh, elements of a language. Uh, so how do you work through that? Do you, you know, can you say a little bit about that process? Mm. 
it's it's difficult you are right like so much of it is in the nuance of the language like the maasai don't even speak swahili they speak ma uh but we had to almost spend an a year and a half finding the translator from the community itself and i think sometimes that becomes a barrier for other like how much time are you willing to invest are you bringing your own translators or are you finding somebody from the community i think in the last 14 15 years of project fuel we've never taken a translator with us we've always found one in the community and had room for uh, for you know uh, discovering and even training them to ask questions sometimes the translator would be like what if she doesn't answer what is your life lesson what do i ask then then spending time with them to say what are the different questions that can help you achieve that i think people you know if you genuinely care they will also rise up like i have a 102 year old grandmother from uh, tanzania who just did not speak that well she was frail but she drew things in the old symbology because she wanted to pass on what she knew so people also become creative um, but i think finding finding translators from local communities is the best bet because then you don't lose things in translation um, A, a lot but yeah it it does possess a challenge but fortunately in all these communities we've been able to work uh, there's always someone available and increasingly so uh, the young masai boy who came to india actually is a good example people are not only work like as we work towards them i think these communities are also working towards us they want the world to hear them when we reached to them and we said we wanted to do a google art and culture exhibit i remember this one masai who said we need it because all the google search pictures are the tourist pictures <laughs> that's not how we stand that's not how we look like it's a very western perspective of our world so i think they are also trying to meet us halfway and that eases the job rather than just you going with the savior syndrome complex it becomes a collaboration and then you ask them what do you have sometimes they say we have this one person who speaks broken english <laughs> and then sometimes they have great illustrators who will draw for you what you want to know uh, and then you spend that time learning from them but it's a work in progress honestly don't have all the answers but still figuring somewhere <laughs> yeah thank you thank you so much thank you. um did you you look like you wanted to say something no i just i just wanted to say thank you deepak for sharing this with us and um hope the world Continue to have more conversations uh, as time goes on. Thank so you. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Yeah.